Welcome to the University of Michigan Dentistry Podcast Series, promoting oral health care worldwide. The most versatile and effective of all scaling instruments is the curette. Like all other dental hygiene instruments, the curette has a handle, a shank which may be straight or modified, and a working end. The curette is a paired instrument, and as such, the instrument must be double-ended or we must have a pair of single-ended instruments. The curette has three uses, scaling, root planing, and curatage. Only the first two, scaling and root planing, are now routinely done by the dental hygienist. Looking at the graphic, you can see the design features of the curette. The curette blade is rounded or curved to adapt to the curvature of the tooth surface. The curette has two cutting edges which meet to form a rounded tip called the toe. The sides or lateral surfaces extend from each cutting edge, curving around to merge and form the convex back surface of the blade. The smooth convex back of the blade allows the cutting edge of the curette to be used in the deepest pocket or sulcus with less possibility of tissue trauma than with other instruments. The flat surface of the blade which lies between the cutting edges is the facial surface or merely the face of the instrument. The curette is usually smaller and thinner than other scaling instruments. Its small size and rounded back also allow it to be inserted easily under firm tissue or into the deep narrow pockets. Looking at the instrument you can see the two lateral edges or cutting edges of the curette the flat facial surface in between, and the rounded toe of the instrument. You can now see the convex back surface of the curette. There are several basic principles that you will need to keep in mind when using the curette. The first of these is angulation. Any instrument that has cutting edges must be angulated for effective calculus removal. Angulation refers to the relationship between the tooth and the um, face of the instrument. Angulation is sometimes referred to as tooth-blade relationship. This graphic illustrates correct instrument angulation. The first diagram illustrates correct insertion angulation. For insertion, the instrument is placed so that the facial surface of the instrument is approximately parallel with the tooth surface. We generally refer to this as zero degrees. The next diagram, view three, shows the position of the blade against the tooth for calculus removal. The blade is opened to approximately 45 to 90 degrees. View 2 shows a tooth blade relationship of less than 45 to 90 degrees. Used in this manner, the blade will slide over the calculus, causing burnishing and leaving small amounts of deposit on the tooth surface. The last diagram illustrates a tooth blade relationship of more than 90 degrees. We must always be conscious of what the free end, the free cutting edge of the curette is doing. In this diagram you can see that the free cutting edge of the curette would be against the epithelial lining of the sulcus. We would have severe trauma and tissue laceration. Remember that correct insertion angulation is zero degrees correct working angulation is 45 to 90 degrees. The second concept you'll need to use is stroke. The exploratory stroke is used to guide the insertion of the curette into the gingival sulcus. 
and to determine the position of the epithelial attachment and the extent of the hard deposit. Insertion angulation of approximately zero degrees is used for the exploratory stroke. The second stroke is the working stroke. The working stroke is a firm stroke away from the epithelial attachment used in very short overlapping strokes. The working stroke is the power stroke by which calculus is removed from the tooth surface. Think of the working stroke as having four steps. The first step is readapting. The exploratory stroke ends with the curette blade at the epithelial attachment or under the base of the deposit. The angle of the blade must now be increased to 45 to 90 degrees while keeping the blade adapted to the tooth surface. Looking at the graphic, you can see the cross section of the curette inserted into the gingival sulcus. The rounded back surface of the curette is against the sulcular epithelium, and the facial surface of the curette is placed at approximately zero degrees or parallel with the tooth surface. This is insertion angulation. Once the curette has been inserted to the base of the deposit and the epithelial attachment has been determined, you must turn the curette, opening it to approximately 45 to 90 degrees. The rounded back surface of the curette is still against the sulcular epithelium, but the edge of the curette against the tooth is now engaged under the deposit and you're ready to continue with your working stroke. The second part of the working stroke involves tightening the grasp. With a firm fulcrum, grasp the instrument without tightening your fingers enough to cut off the circulation. If you tighten your hand too much, you will cut the circulation off from your fingers and lose your tactile sense. We use a very firm but not a tight grasp. The third step is activating the, the stroke. With a firm fulcrum, activate the instrument with action from your wrist. Move the instrument, keeping it carefully adapted in short overlapping strokes toward the gingival margin. And the fourth step is to relax. When the entire surface has been scaled with short overlapping strokes, consciously relax the fingers in preparation for the next exploratory stroke. This exploratory stroke has been completed. I would like to demonstrate for you insertion and working angulation on the typodon. The exploratory angulation is approximately zero degrees. When the curette has been inserted properly, the facial surface of the instrument cannot be seen. Once we have completed our exploratory stroke. We open the blade slightly, 45 to 90 degrees, and you can see that the facial surface is slightly exposed. If there was a deposit there, we would have engaged the deposit and we could now proceed to activate the stroke. Let me do that one more time. Insert the instrument with the face, facial surface parallel with the tooth. We cannot see the facial surface of the instrument. Complete the exploratory stroke. Open the blade 45 to 90 degrees. We have engaged the, depo the deposit. Activate our stroke. On the buccal surface, we are not able to close the blade quite as much because of the anatomy of the tooth. We get as close to zero degrees as possible. Open the blade slightly. Activate the stroke. One of the most versatile and widely used series of curettes is the Columbia University series. The series includes four curettes, all with varying degrees of modifications in their shank. The Columbia 1314, which you see here, is the smallest curette in the series. It has a slightly modified shank and a small working end. The Columbia 1314 is called a universal curette. 
because it adapts to all areas of the mouth. Its small blade size allows insertion into even the smallest area. Like all curettes, the Columbia 1314 has two cutting edges, a rounded tip, and the convex back surface. Remember that curettes are paired instruments and are mirror images of one another. I would like to demonstrate some basic principles for use of the Columbia 1314 curette. Because the instrument is a paired instrument, we must first know which end of the curette to use. We will use that end of the curette which best adapts to the mesial surface when scaling in the posterior teeth. This means that scaling from the first premolar to the last molar or the most posterior tooth, we will use the end that best adapts to the mesial surface. When adapted to the mesial surface, we should not be able to see the facial surface of the blade. This would be the wrong end of the curette for use on the mesial surface of this tooth. The end of the curette which best adapts to the mesial surface is used for both the mesial and distal surfaces as well as the buccal surface. The Columbia curette is held with a modified pen grasp. A stable fulcrum is determined and notice that my fulcrum for the first molar is on the bicuspid area on the occlusal surface. And then beginning with the distal surface of the tooth. I would like to work around from distal to mesial on this first molar for you. We begin with our insertion. Holding the instrument with your modified pen grasp and a firmly fixed fulcrum, insert the instrument at an oblique angle, gently sliding it under the gingival tissue. Remember that the facial surface of the blade is at approximately zero degrees insertion angulation to the tooth surface. Once we have completed our exploratory stroke and have determined the epithelial attachment, we achieve our working angulation by pushing up on our fulcrum. Our working stroke is then activated by raising and lowering our wrist in a series of short overlapping strokes. Notice that my wrist is activating the instrument and there is no independent finger action. When the distal surface has been scaled, turn the instrument with the tip going toward the mesial surface and readapt it at the disto buccal line angle. Insert the instrument by passing it gently under the gingival margin, opening the blade by rocking slightly toward the buccal on your fulcrum finger. And then activate the instrument by rocking from buccal to lingual on the fulcrum finger. Continuing around the mesiobuccal line angle. The mesiobuccal line angle, you may need to slightly readapt your instrument. Open the blade to working angulation by dropping your wrist a little. And then continue to activate by raising and lowering the wrist similar to what you did on the distal surface. Now going back to the distal surface, I would like you to observe the blade of the instrument. Insert the instrument near insertion stroke with the blade parallel with the tooth surface. Open 
begin to activate the instrument in short overlapping strokes. As you move around the distal surface, you may need to readapt the instrument by rolling the instrument between your fingers with each stroke. When at least one half of the distal surface has been scaled, then you will turn your instrument and begin the buckle surface. Turning the instrument slightly, I think you can see it turning slightly from the shank with each stroke. And then, as you come to the mesial surface, readapting as necessary, opening your blade, and again, short overlapping strokes working across the mesial surface. The next surface you would work on would then be the next distal surface. Again, distal, complete the distal surface, go to the buccal surface, and then to the mesial surface, working this way through the mesial surface of the first premolar. Sequencing your scaling procedures is very simple with the Columbia curette because the instrument adapts to opposite areas of the mouth. For example, the end of the curette that we are now using on the mandibular right buccal surfaces will adapt to the mandibular left lingual surfaces. If I were to turn the instrument around, you would see that the opposite end of the instrument would adapt to the mandibular right lingual surfaces and the mandibular left buccal surfaces. When we were talking about choosing the correct end of the instrument, I told you that we choose that end of the instrument which best adapts to the mesial surface when scaling the posterior teeth. When scaling the anterior teeth, any tooth from cuspid through cuspid, we select that end of the instrument which best adapts to the surface we are going to be working on. Let me demonstrate that on the distal surface of the mandibular right cuspid. Select that end of the instrument which best adapts to the tooth you are going to be working on. Therefore, the instrument that wraps around the distal surface is the correct end of the instrument. We would use this end of our instrument on a distal surface, turning our instrument and using the opposite end for the buckle and the mesial surface. Let me repeat the choice of um, ends of the instrument. That end of the instrument which best adapts to the mesial surface is used in the posterior areas of the mouth. That end of the instrument which best adapts to the tooth we are working on, the surface of the tooth we are working on, is used for the anterior teeth. I would like to demonstrate the use of the Columbia 1314 curette intraorally for you. Let me begin by going over the choice of the end of the instrument again for you. On the mandibular right quadrant, the buccal surface. Remember that we use that end of the instrument on the posterior teeth, which best adapts to the mesial surface of the tooth. Keep in mind that when we adapt the instrument to the mesial surface, we are placing the lower cutting edge against the tooth surface. We begin on the distal surface. We've properly selected the end of our instrument. Turning your instrument so that the upper cutting edge is now against the tooth, insert the instrument using an oblique stroke. Once the instrument is inserted and the exploratory stroke is complete, Establish the working angulation by raising the instrument by pushing up on your fulcrum. Remember now that the lower cutting edge is free to traumatize the gingival tissue if you open your blade more than 45 degrees. The upper cutting edge is against the tooth surface. We activate the instrument using a series of short, overlapping, working strokes.
continuing until at least one half of the distal surface has been scaled. Now turning your instrument so that the tip or toe of the instrument is toward the mesial, begin at the distal buckle line angle with insertion angulation of zero degrees. It slide the edge of the curette under the marginal gingiva for your insertion and exploratory stroke. Open the blade to establish working angulation and then rocking on your wrist, complete your series of short overlapping working strokes. As you come to the mesial buckle line angle, you will simply readapt your instrument, reestablish your working angulation, and activate the instrument by creating a series of short overlapping strokes, raising and lowering your wrist. Continue until you have covered at least one half of the mesial surface. I would like to show you the placement of the instrument in the other areas of the mouth. The end of the instrument that we used in this quadrant will adapt to the lingual surfaces on the mandibular left side. To do the buccal surfaces on the mandibular left side, you turn the instrument around and move to the right rear position. Our instrument end adapts to the mesial surface. To adapt it to the distal, we use the upper cutting edge, an oblique exploratory stroke, raise our wrist slightly to achieve our working angulation. When we have completed the distal surface, turning the tip or the toe of the instrument toward the mesial, adapt it at the distal buccal line angle, achieve our working angulation by rocking forward or toward the buccal surface on our fulcrum finger. When we have a come across the buccal surface all the way, readapt at the mesial surface. Retracting the lip with our fingers. Insert the instrument, achieve your exploratory and your working angulation. Going to the maxillary left side buccal surface, we are again using the same end of the instrument that we used on the mandibular buccal right surfaces. That end of the instrument which adapts to the mesial surface of the tooth. Inserting the face of the instrument so that it is parallel with the, with the surface of the tooth, achieve our exploratory angulation, achieve your working angulation by simply moving the shank of the instrument toward the distal surface. Now we'll open your blade for you and then activate your instrument to create your short overlapping working strokes. Follow the same procedures we did in the other quadrants of the mouth in readapting to the me to the buccal surface and then to the mesial surface. To do the maxillary right buccal surfaces, we would use the same end of the instrument that we used on the mandibular left buccal surfaces. The instrument adapts to the mesial surface of the tooth. To insert it on the distal, you will have to bring your, your wrist out somewhat. Insert the instrument at zero degrees. Achieve your working angulation by rolling the shank of the instrument, bringing the handle somewhat toward the distal. Create your short overlapping working strokes. Readapt the instrument at the distal buckle line angle. Continue around the distal surface, readapting at the mesial, and then completing your working strokes. For the anterior teeth, use that end of the instrument 
which best adapts to the surface you are working on. For instance, on the mesial surface of tooth number eight, I would use this end of the instrument. To do the distal surface, I would simply turn my instrument so that the end adapts to the distal surface. In scaling these teeth, I would do from the midline of the tooth toward the distal surface, turning my instrument, beginning again at the midline, overlapping a small portion of it, and going toward the mesial. You've been listening to a presentation from the University of Michigan School of Dentistry, which is dedicated to supporting open learning and open educational resources. This recording is licensed under the Creative Commons. It may be reused and redistributed for nonprofit use. Please attribute materials to the University of Michigan School of Dentistry and redistribute under this same license. For more information on how this and other University of Michigan School of Dentistry recordings may be used, visit www.dent.umich.edu/license.